Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm really happy to have you all here and our guest speaker. I'm also incredibly honored and thrilled to have here. Uh, my name is Kelly Taxter. I'm the director of the parish, and I'm really pleased to welcome you here this evening. Um, we are going to hear from Justin Beal, who has a forthcoming book from MIT Press titled Sand Future, um, which is the topic of our conversation tonight. But before we begin, I want to take just a minute, as always, to thank the people that make these Friday night evenings possible, um, in part funded by the New York State Council for the Arts. Friday nights at the parish are made possible in part by our presenting sponsor, Bank of America. And additional support is provided by the Corcoran Group and Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. Thank you very much. And we're, I'm very honored and I'm just, I'm thrilled that we were able to do this. For the entire month of September, first responders and healthcare workers are granted free admission to the museum, which is courtesy of Bank of America. So I'm, I'm as I said, very pleased to have Justin Beal here tonight on the eve of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. On the occasion of the opening of the exhibition Aftermath, Images from Ground Zero, which documents the site and its reconstruction um, by images by uh, Joel Meyerowitz, an incredible photographer who, oddly, my career has been entwined with since 1999, when I was the director of a gallery above a tennis club in Provincetown, Massachusetts, where he was represented. So I'm from one beach community to another somehow. Um, Joel and I have followed each other. So it is really kind of uh, lovely to, to see his work here and have my person be here as well. Um, and Justin, I, I have also known for, for many moons, um, many lives, it seems at this point. Um, and this is his first book, his first book of this nature. You've made artist books, but this is a very different animal. And it explores the life of the architect Minoru Yamasaki, who is the architect of the World Trade Center. And it opens up a dialogue and offers different moments of reflection about desolation, destruction, transformation, and rebirth. Justin is an artist with an extensive exhibition history in the United States and Europe. He graduated from Yale University, University with a degree in architecture and design and continued his studies at the Whitney Independent Study Program and the University of Southern California. His work has been reviewed in the New York Times, The New Yorker, Art Forum, Freeze, Art in America, an interview, and the Los Angeles Times. And his work is included in the permanent collections of the Albright Knox Museum, the Hammer Museum, and the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles. And he is currently teaching at Hunter College. Um, and I know a lot of press about this book dropped today, so you can read about it more online. But I think most importantly, please join me in welcoming Justin to talk about Sand Future. Thank you, Kelly, for that introduction. Um, for those of you who don't know, today is Kelly's birthday. Uh, thank you all. <laughs> yes. Thank you also to Corinne and Victor for your help uh, arranging all of this. Um, <clears throat> it's an honor to be here in this beautiful building speaking about this book, uh, really for the first time. So I'm fair warning, you're all part of a bit of an experiment here. Uh, as I attempt to talk about a very non-linear book in a linear fashion. Um, so this is gonna be a, a talk about this book, Sand Future. Um, I was gonna read a portion of the book, but I've dispensed with that in the interest of time because I am gonna read excerpts as I go through this talk. And uh, uh, yeah, as Kelly said, it's a book that will be coming out next week on Tuesday. And it's a book that's mostly about this man, Minoru Yamasaki, but there are also parts of the book, half of it really, that are about other things, sick building syndrome, the contemporary art world, 432 Park Avenue, migraine, pharmaceutical architecture. But the linear chronological thread that holds these disparate parts together is the story of Yamasaki's life and career. Um, 
In a sense, this book began 20 years ago when I graduated from college and moved into a cheap, crowded apartment three blocks south of the World Trade Center in Manhattan. When I arrived, I was immediately obsessed with these two towers, shown here in a pair of photographs taken by Peter Hujar in 1976. They were spectacular. They may not have worked well as buildings, but they were extraordinary as objects. I would visit them at night when the plaza between them was empty. It was always empty at night. And you could lean back against the corner of the building and look up. It was like looking up at a aluminum, lying on an aluminum road. And clouds would catch on them, and <clears throat> because I was a 20-year-old art student, I carried a camera with me everywhere I went, and I would take pictures of the fog at night around the building. Um, I remember being surprised at the time by the fact that despite having just completed a very rigorous degree in architecture, I had no idea who designed them. It was during those first few weeks when I lived in that apartment that I began to connect the World Trade Center to Yamasaki, and then in turn to connect Yamasaki to the Eastern Airlines Terminal at Logan Airport a building I loved as a child because it was so unlike anything else in Boston. Uh, also to the iconic images of the collapse of Pruitt-Igo apartments, which I had of course seen, but no one ever told me who designed them. Um, then in time, I would also connect Yamasaki to other pieces of really his monumental career, like the Robertson Hall at Princeton uh, or the Century City Towers in Los Angeles, as, as well as the hotel. I only lived near the buildings for a few weeks. Uh, because, and then on the morning of September 11th, I left for work and the sky was full of smoke and again, as a young art student, I had my camera in tow and rather by accident, I took this photograph, um, which I haven't really shown to, to anyone in 20 years. I mean, I've shown it to a few people who are close to me and it's not in the book, but I decided that, um, you know, on the occasion of the anniversary, it, it was sort of time to let it out into the world. Um, so <clears throat> with that, uh, let's cut forward 11 years. This book begins like any tawdry piece of fiction on a dark and stormy night in October 2012 as Hurricane Sandy is bearing down on the East Coast of the United States. In the decade since 9-11, I had embarked on a moderately successful art career, which is how I had come to meet my wife, Jane, on whom the character Nina is based. And she owned an art gallery on the lower lying swath of made land that comprised the western end edge of Chelsea. In an abundance of caution, she and her partner had lifted all the artwork stored in the basement four feet above the floor. When they were finally able to get to the space the next day, they found the entire basement and much of the first floor had been flooded completely. As a result, I, along with many other people, some of, here who, um, some of whom are here in this room tonight, ended up spending several weeks dragging dead, waterlogged objects, many of which were made by very close friends of mine out of the basement. It was a kind of profound experience for me and one that changed my relationship to making physical things. And this all happened at a point in my career when I had finally managed to make a living uh, making art, but the objects coming out of the studio were beginning to feel less sincere, or, or like they were less authentically my own. I felt I needed to do something different, and as I settled back into work again after nearly three months dragging these objects out of the basement, I found I wanted to work with a material that could move between people more easily. Uh, I had to finish some shows that I was already committed to, but then I decided I was going to devote a year to writing. At first, I, that writing was going to be about sick building syndrome, a subject which, like Yamasaki, I had always felt was inadequately addressed in my architectural education. It was also a logical outgrowth of the work that I had been making at the time, uh, which had mostly to do with the relationship between bodies and buildings. For as long as there have been buildings, buildings have been compared to bodies, right? Vitruvius established this tradition by mapping the proportions of the ideal human body onto the ideal building in his 10 books of architecture, which are widely considered to be the oldest surviving architectural texts. The building is a body. This is why chimneys have throats and vaults have ribs. It's why hinges have knuckles. This is why a tongue fits a groove. Indeed, 2,000 years of architectural history might be reduced to a gradual deterioration of the primacy of this body building analogy, culminating in a point in the late 20th century when buildings began to get sick. Um, I've always been interested in that moment, that moment of collapse and the way 
it was embodied in this phenomenon of sick building syndrome in the 70s and the 80s and sort of Reagan era United States. Um, cause, because sick building was a very definable thing. Uh, it was a direct result of unregulated construction materials and dramatic reductions in ventilation standards, but it was regarded as a marginal phenomenon, something psychosomatic or hysterical, and so it had always struck me, you know, it was never really properly accounted for in architectural discourse or, or medical discourse. Uh, and it always struck me as a very productive way of thinking about how bodies and buildings interact, uh, in part because the name sick building syndrome allows it to be both an illness and a metaphor at the same time. Um, I'll return to sick building syndrome later, but the point for the moment is that sick building syndrome led me on this tangent to thinking about architects who struggled with chronic illness, and that led me first to Stornley Cracklight, who was the protagonist of Peter Greenaway's 1986 film, The Belly of the Architect, and then in full circle back to Yamasaki, who s struggled with chronic illness his entire life, suffering first from severe ulcers and later, like crack light, from stomach cancer. And it was then that I got deeper into Yamasaki's story, and the deeper I got, the more I realized the book that I had begun to write needed to be a book about him and not sick buildings. <clears throat> so, who was Yamasaki? He was born in a cold water tenement in Seattle in 1912. His parents were immigrants from Japan. Uh, he graduated from architecture school as the country was sliding into, into depression and he moved to New York where he eventually got a job working for Shreve, Lamb and Harmon, the architects of the Empire State Building. He was assigned to a team working then on the Parkchester Apartments, a massive middle income housing estate in the Bronx <coughs> that was one of the first applications in America of the sort of modernist idea of the tower and the park. After working on Parkchester for three years, Yamasaki and his brother applied to rent an apartment in the complex, only to be turned away by discriminatory management. Then he met his wife, Terry, and they got married on Friday, December 5th, 1941. They spent the night dancing on the roof of the Astor Hotel, and then on Sunday morning, the Japanese Navy bombed Pearl Harbor. The ground shifted under his feet. Because he was a US citizen and a very good architect, he was able to continue working and he was put in charge of designing a naval base in upstate New York. Here too, he was twice turned away at the gate by MPs who mistook him for a spy. Things were, of course, much harder on the West Coast. There were 120,000 Japanese Americans, 72,000 of whom, at least, were US citizens who were sent to internment camps. He was able to help his parents move to New York, where they shared a crowded apartment with him and his brother and his wife. After work at Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon dried up, he went on to work for Wallace Harrison and Raymond Lowy. He nearly opened an office with George Nelson, and then Nelson took a job at Herman Miller. The Americans bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and Yamasaki accepted an offer from a Detroit-based firm and moved to Michigan in 1945. In Detroit, he found a creative community, the Saarinens, Harry Bertoia, Florence Knoll, Alexander Girard, but restrictive covenants prevented him from living among his peers in Birmingham and Bloomfield Hills. He settled instead in the unincorporated town of Troy, where he became friends with the young Hungarian photographer, Balthazar Korob. He eventually went out on his own with two of his co-workers, Joseph Leenweber and George Helmuth. Helmuth was very well connected in St. Louis, and when Harry Truman passed the American Housing Act in 1949 and gave federal funding for some clearance, the St. Louis Housing Authority gave Yamasaki and Helmuth the job of designing a massive new public housing complex called Pruitt Igo. Yama proposed a variety of mixed height buildings and row houses, insisting that no building exceed seven stories. Austere as it was, his proposal still exceeded the federal government's maximum cost per unit, and the housing authority pushed back. By the time the project was presented for federal approval, the design had been reduced to 33 identical 11-story towers. As construction progressed, the design continued to be undermined by relentless value engineering and inflated construction costs. One by one, amenities were eliminated, windows were made smaller, materials were exchanged for cheaper alternatives. Yamasaki described the final result as tragically insensitive, but critics applauded it. An architectural forum called it the best high-rise apartment of 1951. His next major project was a soaring concourse for the Lambert St. Louis Airport that combined three concrete barrel vaults into an easily legible metaphor for flight. It was a resounding success. 
This is another, this is actually a photograph from uh, a Reynolds metal catalog. In December 1953, when Lambert was still under construction, doctors discovered that Yamasaki's stomach was severely ulcerated and that he was bleeding internally. He underwent emergency surgery and remained in the hospital for eight weeks while surgeons removed two thirds of his stomach. He was working on a commission for the US consulate in Kobe at the time, and he decided to take a trip through Europe and Asia. The most influential part of that trip was likely an itinerary in India that took him through Chandigarh, Agra, Fatapur Sikri, and New Delhi. And this would have been right after Le Corbusier started building his planned city for Chandigarh. Yamasaki found Corbusier's government buildings too imposing for a young democracy. He loved the Mughal forts at Fatapur Sikri and the Taj Mahal just as much as he hated Chandigarh, and the basic forms of Islamic ornament became an enduring influence on his work. When he returned to Detroit, he published two articles in Architectural Record, the first, Architecture for Enjoyment, and the second, Visual Delight in Architecture. And they're both sincere, intuitive pieces of writing that arrive at the conclusion that monumental architecture is bad for democracy. And I think it's important in those articles to understand that Yamasaki recognized that this project of modernism, both in architecture and writ large, had extraordinary potential but that it had lost sight of the ways in which it was leaving the individual person, right? The individual body inside the building behind. Um, and he, you know, he, that solving that problem, addressing that need, it really became an underlying principle of his work. Uh, you know, and I've come to think of him as I've worked on this book as a very kind of sensitive, emotionally, physically sensitive person trying to move the course of modern architecture in a more humanistic direction. So it's then that he returns to Detroit and makes what are really his signature works. The first is a McGregor Memorial Conference Center at Wayne State University in downtown Detroit. This photograph, uh, like some of the others I've shown by his friend Baltazar Korab. This is another photograph, and then I'm gonna, there's a photograph of the interior uh, and these doors. The second building, I have to admit, it's kind of my favorite. It's the, the regional headquarters of the Reynolds Metal Company, and it was opened slightly later in 1959. And, and this building came about in the context, the specific context of, the, of what was called the product building. This was a building that was designed really to be an advertisement for aluminum, and it was positioned like a billboard on the side of the highway leaving Detroit. And what was so interesting about that is it allowed him to kind of perform this sort of oddly postmodern sleight of hand because the idea that form follows function can get sort of short-circuited by the idea of a building whose function is to advertise a material. So he starts, he's, he's trying in this building to show you everything that aluminum can do. Uh, and, and as a result, creates this building that is at once kind of very modern and very ornamental at the same time. And you can see in this building this circular pattern, these two overlapping grids of circles uh, are almost like a direct copy of a, a screen in, at the, in Fatapur Sikri in India. So he's bringing this kind of Islamic ornament into to his modernist practice. I also love this building because it has such a clear influence on contemporary work. This is a picture of Reynolds on the top and a picture of David Ajay's uh, American Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C. Sadly, uh, Reynolds is, just sits abandoned on the side of the highway now. It's been empty for the, for the last four or five years. It was briefly a Bally's gym in the 80s. Another building from this time was a desert airfield designed when Doran was still a, largely an outpost for Saudi Aramco and the US military. Yamasaki designed this airport for Saudi Arabia with a clean, clean white facade composed of a system of interlocking pointed arches. The composition incorporated traditional Arabic tracery, but it was defiantly modern. Uh, a combination of ornamental surface treatment and modernist form that would become a signature of both Yamasaki's future work and the emerging style of the Saudi royal family, who were just embarking on an era of prolific nation building. King Saud considered the finished structure the only building in the country that looked like a Saudi building, and it became a symbol around which the nation was struggling to find its international identity could build an architectural sense of self. Here it is pictured on two different Saudi real notes that remained in circulation for 25 years. 
The Duran Airport earned Yamasaki his fourth AIA award in eight years, outpacing rivals like Saarinen and Skidmoreungs and Merrill, which kind of gives a sense of his position at that time. But it was also an uneasy time for him personally, and he and Terry got divorced in 1961. Now, I think this is a really kind of key point in his life because his interaction, uh, you know, in general, Yamasaki did not leave a very generous archive. There's not a ton of information. But what's clear and what remains is that his interaction with his peers, which until that point had included a really active correspondence with Bruno Zevi, Jane Jacobs, Buckminster Fuller, Neutra, Rudolph, these like epic nights drinking with Mies van der Rohe and Wallace Harrison, that became increasingly limited. And his new work was largely dismissed by the sort of elite architects as too decorative. Paul Rudolph thought it was mannerist. Venturi thought it was picturesque. Uh, Rainer Banham called it epicene. I.M. Pei called it uh, capricious. And Gordon Bunshaft later told Time Magazine that Yamasaki was as much of an architect as I am Napoleon. <laughs> Adding later, he was an architect, but now he's nothing but a decorator. So it was in this moment in his career when a key figure rises to his defense, Otto Louise Huxtable, who is in a way as much of a character in this book as Yama. Um, she wrote in Modern and Art in America that if modern architecture may be said to have already established a tradition, Yamasaki is shattering it with remarkable sensitivity to the moment. She acknowledged how to a generation of architects trained in doctrines of ornament is crime, form follows function, and less is more. This is close to an aesthetic transgression. And she takes pains to defend his practice as deliberately decorative, but also sensitive, conscientious, exploratory, and very beautiful. Meanwhile, in New York, David Rockefeller has a problem. The gradual exodus of white collar workers from Wall Street office buildings to Midtown to landmarks like the Chrysler and Empire State Buildings posed a problem for Rockefeller and for Chase, which had significant real estate holdings in the financial district. Uh, after consulting with family friends William Zeckendorf and Bob Moses, Rockefeller concluded that the only path forward was to create first one massive project, the Chase Tower, and then an even bigger project to catalyze the growth of, of Lower Manhattan. And at a small conference, uh, press conference in 1960, he formally announced a plan for a massive World Trade Center. He coined the term, sort of with an uncharacteristic flourish for him, catalytic bigness to define the project's intended magnitude, which was essentially to sort of be like a, an economic defibrillator uh, to change the course of development in Lower Manhattan. <laughs> this is just a brief aside, but it also happens that about two weeks after that press conference, Rockefeller was also atten in attendance in the MoMA Sculpture Garden for the performance of Jean Tingley's self-destroying sculpture, Homage to New York. Uh, I'll refer, re return to this later. Oh, not, not there yet. So Rockefeller needed the Port Authority to build the World Trade Center for two key reasons. The first was they had access to more money than the city. And the second was that they had the ability to take land, almost any land, by eminent domain. So Rockefeller partnered the Port Authority with a genius committee comprised of Edward Durrell Stone, Gordon Bunshaft, and Wallace Harrison, tasked to revise the plan and choose a new architect. The Port Authority, I think, recognized that those three architects were Rockefeller architects, and they wanted something different. And so they chose to uh, put together their own list. And it was an odd list. It included I.M. Pei, Philip Johnson, Welton Beckett, Gropius, Yamasaki. Mies van der Rohe was not included, which is interesting, I think, because the Port Authority thought he was too old. And, and they were right. He was dead by the time the building was finished. But it was actually a, a deputy of Austin Tobin, the director of the Port Authority, a guy named Guy Tizzoli, who really pushed Yamasaki to the front. Uh, he had seen this pavilion that Yamasaki designed in Seattle uh, and thought that he was the right architect for the job. And I think it's important also to recognize that there, there's something in the ethics, the sort of ethos of the Port Authority, which was that they didn't want 
a, a kind of super elite architect. They wanted somebody who had broad popular appeal, and I think they thought Yamasaki could deliver that uh, for them. So he was offered the job. He was actually still in Seattle, just a mile or two from where he grew up working on this project when he was offered the job. And I think it was a complicated moment for him because he knew it was too big a job for his office. He'd always wanted to keep the office a certain size. Uh, and this would have meant, this did mean expanding it quite significantly, but it was also a job that no architect could say no to. It was the highest profile job in the world. So he takes the job and on January 18th, 1963, he's on the cover of Time Magazine which um, I think is, is, is interesting because it's a, you know, I can count the architects who have ever been on the cover of Time Magazine on two hands, and they're all household names, Frank Lloyd Wright, Buckminster Fuller, um, Saarinen. But, you know, this is really sort of the apex of his career. There, there are still not very many details in this article. It's also, it's also, I think it's also important to notice that, the, that they lead First of all, the title is A Road to Xanadu, and then they leave with, lead with this picture of the Taj Mahal, not a picture of his work. So there's definitely a sort of orientalist overtone to how, how the work is presented. But it's still a major moment in his career. That's a good ringtone, if that's what it is. Um, and actually sort of at the end of the article, the Time Magazine article, one of the final lines is that if Yamasaki can keep a firm control of the job, the World Trade Center will be one of the greatest opportunities ever presented to an architect. Um, okay, so I'm gonna shift gears here for a second and change registers and bring you all back into the parallel narrative of the book. Um, so we're back at the, in the, weeks after the hurricane. And this is a map of flooding in New York. And a couple days actually after the hurricane, I, I had to walk uptown uh, to get something for the gallery. And I, I realized then how the flood really was a reminder of, of how much New York has been shaped by um, the level of the land and the water level and the distance from the water and the way in which that, that's in, you know, the, the wealthiest people have always lived up in the ho highest land, both because of flooding and because of disease like tuberculosis and cholera that defined, you know, that were rampant in the lower lying downtown marshland. Um, it was a reminder not only of climate change, but of the fundamental influence disease has always exerted on architecture. Long before sick building syndrome, one disease in particular became a foundational metaphor for early modernism. Uh, and this is an image of Alvaro Alto's sanatorium in Paimio. Um, a compelling case has been made by a number of architectural historians that every distinctive feature of modern architecture, the white walls, the broad windows, the sterile unupholstered surfaces, the lack of ornament, well-ventilated interiors and sun-soaked roof gardens, can be traced back to the tuberculosis sanatorium and the medical prescriptions for the treatment of tuberculosis. It, an idea that sort of introduces the possibility that modernism might not actually have been a radical social experiment so much as a, as a radical medical experiment. And I think it's important in thinking about that to recognize that, that oh, as compelling as these sanatoriums were, they had two fundamental problems. The, the first being that they didn't work and you know, we, ne we never were able to really control tuberculosis until we figured out how to treat it with antibiotics. And the second, was that tuberculosis was really a disease of, of working class, overcrowded living conditions of the Industrial Revolution, and sanatoriums were by and large uh, available only to those who could afford to spend three or six or nine months uh, resting there. It was also around the time of the hurricane that plans were first announced for this building, 432 Park Avenue, which I, became fascinated with in a way that was sort of similar to my fascination with the World Trade Center. Uh, you know, for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's a building that is about 1,400 feet tall uh, on a footprint, slightly smaller than a baseball diamond. It's four identical facades, each with six columns of identical 10-foot square windows. And then every 12 stories, there's a circular 
concrete cylinder on a mechanical floor. So the windows, there's no glazing on the windows, and so you get this circle within the square. Um, you can kind of, like, if you listen carefully, you can hear Louis Kahn, like, rolling in his grave. But um, uh, it was this incredibly narrow building, the narrowest it's ever been built in Manhattan, and, and it was taller when it was completed than anything else on, in the city. Um, it's really just an aggressively minimal building, uh, but not like in a conceptual Donald Judd kind of minimalism, more like a um, sort of boutique-y, Fendi kind of minimalism. Um, but before it was even built, this building, this is actually a rendering. What's great about this photograph is it was, it, it's a real photograph that was taken by a drone, and then they rendered a bathroom around it. Um, this tower so fundamentally altered the Midtown skyline that the New York Mets and the New York Fire Department are said to have held special meetings to discuss modifying the skylines on their logos. The fact that both declined to make any change is a reflection of the city's reluctance to embrace a building entirely devoid of any discernible civic or cultural or commercial content. It's not really a building for New Yorkers, right? I mean, anyone who spent any time in New York would not choose, uh, given unlimited resources, to live in Midtown. But it's, in fact, a building whose apartments are mostly owned as investments. It is, as J.G. Ballard wrote, of the city surrounding the high-rise in his eponymous novel, an environment built for not for man, but for man's absence. And if Ballard's high-rise forecast the dramatic class stratification of London in the 1970s and 80s, 432 Park might tell the story with the growing extremes of wealth inequality that are changing the landscape of New York. Uh, as Raphael Vignoli, who designed the towers, told the reporter when it was under construction, New York has increasingly become a city where there are only two markets, ultra-luxury and subsidized housing. So, oh. And I, oh, there, there, I mean, there's also a reason why this is important if you're wondering why am I talking about this building in relationship to the World Trade Center. This, there's a very sort of crude way of thinking about the tallest building in Manhattan, but if you, if you consider it as an index of, of where power resides from the very beginning, right? So the first, at first the tallest structures on the island were Lenape, temporary Lenape hunting shelters. The Dutch arrive and they build a fort, right? So which is like sort of a symbol of military power. Gradually, that's replaced by Trinity and Collegiate and these churches that remained the tallest buildings on the island for a long time until sort of mercantile commerce builds Singer, Woolworth, Chrysler, eventually the Empire State Building. And then the World Trade Center is the tallest building, but it, it, it's not really about corporate power. It's about this kind of weird synergy of corporate and bureaucratic interests, um, kind of big government, private public partnership. And what's so interesting to me about 432 Park, which of course now has been surpassed by several other buildings that are even taller and narrower than it, is it, is it suggests that power net now may reside in the hands of sort of private wealth more than anything else. Um, so, <clears throat> the building goes up, it becomes sort of a marker of time, the gallery reopens, and I'm starting to work on this book. Uh, I, I'm feeling very good about my project. I'm writing the first book about Yamasaki in English in almost 40 years. And I'm about two years into this leap that I've taken, totally sabotaging my career as an artist, and I hear from a friend that somebody else is writing a book about Yamasaki. And I get, you know, for a week I'm completely defeated, crestfallen, you know, this book's coming out. It's being published by Yale. It turns out to, to have been a very good book written by a man named Dale Allen Geyer. And after about a week of feeling horrible for myself and thinking I've, I've really led myself astray, I realized that <clears throat> it, it, it allowed me, he, he was taking on this burden of really representing Yamasaki's career in a way that would be available for students and for scholars in a full comprehensive way. And what he made was a really beautiful book uh, that covers everything. It's a kind of totally comprehensive monograph. And that allowed me to be much more experimental with what I was doing and realize that, you know, what I was actually trying to write about was my own experience of architecture and how I felt that, you know, the best books about architecture are the ones that are not 
books about architecture, right? Like if you want to learn about sanatoriums, read Thomas Mann. If you want to learn about postmodern architecture, read Bartolome. Uh, if you want to read about New York after 9-11, read Teju Cole. Uh, and maybe my favorite example is if you want to learn about architects, read the seventh chapter of James Salter's book, Light Years. It would, you'll learn more than uh, anything ever written by an architect. So that allowed, this all allowed me to kind of let <clears throat> other things into the book, right? To explore other avenues um, and let these connections begin to inform the whole process. And one of those moments was uh, discussing migraines with my wife who suffers from quite chronic migraine and realizing the way that her experience of the built environment had allowed me to understand my own in a very different way. And uh, I kind of realized this all looking at this one drawing from Oliver Sacks' book, Migraine, that um, you know, is him trying to explain the relationship of these different phenomena, but he sort of it occurred to me that he was doing it in, as an architectural plan. And I started to realize that there, there are all these ways in which Jane or Nina, her, her experience of the built environment was really helping me to understand both this, what I was trying to figure out with sick building syndrome and also Yamasaki's own experience um, struggling with, with illness in his life and, and, and how it informed his own buildings. Um, and so all of these different kinds of tangents emerge. Uh, there's, there's another episode where I get stoned and go on this tour of the Novartis campus in Basel, but I'm, I don't really have time to explain all of that, so you'll have to read the book. Um, so I'm going to jump now back to the, to the World Trade Center. Uh, it's important to understand here that the, um, the, the Port Authority didn't begin with the intention to build the tallest building in the world. Um, the, the program called for 10 million square feet of office space. That was more office space than existed in the entire city of Detroit at the time. Mm -hmm. And Yamasaki had to figure out where to put it. And he tried to do all these different models. And eventually, he arrived at this scheme of two 90-foot towers. That still wasn't enough. They still didn't fit everything in there. And it's very hard to figure out what exactly happened next, where the jump came to the tallest buildings. And part of the reason it's hard, it's funny, I, I didn't realize this until about two years into writing the book. I kept coming up against this problem that there were no, you think with a bureaucratic entity like the Port Authority, there would be millions of minutes and documents and information about meetings and stuff. And it was only kind of halfway through the process of this book that I realized the reason that none of those exist is because the entire Port Authority archive, 750,000 volumes that was attended to by three full-time librarians, was in the World Trade Center. So there's no record, not only of the World Trade Center, but of all these other Port Authority projects. But what's clear is that at some point, Guy Chizoli, who I mentioned before, goes out to Detroit and he tells Yamasaki um, that they're gonna build the two tallest buildings in the world. Uh, and Yamasaki was not happy about that. He was very upset, but again, really had no choice but to try and make it work. And he ultimately did that um, Okay, I'm gonna. I'm skipping ahead here. I want to go back. I want to go back for a second. Well, okay. They had to, in order to do that, they had to change this sort of whole fundamental idea of, of construction, uh, vertical construction, and they did this by stacking the elevators, right, making local and express elevators kind of the way the local and express subway trains work, which had allowed them to put three elevators in one elevator shaft, and then they also used this tube frame that made the building kind of function like a, stru uh, a truss. So it was much, much stronger and much lighter than any other building. And so they were able to, to build taller than ever before, but also to increase the efficiency. So each building had kind of an acre of column-free um, floor space on each floor. But I think it's important here also to realize that when these buildings were unveiled, you can see Rockefeller and Yamasaki at the center there, that Yamasaki was still very committed to this idea that he was going to open up the space on the ground uh, and create this real, like, civic plaza, right? You know, he described it as a mecca, a great relief from the experience of the narrow streets and sidewalks surrounding the Wall Street area. He had envisioned it full of trees and water features and sculpture. Of course, all of that got kind of slowly eliminated. And um, when you read his descriptions now of this building that really symbolized 
world peace through world trade, it feels kind of almost impossibly naive. But um, I think at this time he still really believed in that. And, and the other thing that's striking about this photo is it just, it doesn't look like a Yamasaki building. And I think you, know, you could see if you were on the other side, the delicate little arches at the bottom of the plaza, but all that anyone saw when this photo was, went public was these two massive buildings. Um, so, preparing the site was another matter entirely. There were 13 city blocks that would have to be removed from maps forever. It's this, they call this demapping. And so this was the site that was being cleared. There were, of course, tons of lawsuits, but there was almost nothing that anyone could do to stop the Port Authority. Uh, I'm gonna, there's a longer story about that, but I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over that. But you get this kind of giant 11 acre void that has to be dug out and they finally push it through and they start cleaning, clearing out this huge bathtub. And I think within the context of an art museum, I, I, I think it's interesting to consider this pit uh, almost as like a work of land art and it, because it was built it was dug uh, the summer before Michael Heiser did dug double negative, and it involves almost twice as much earth as double negative, and it's so big you could fit the entire sort of fiddlehead of the spiral jetty inside of it, and I think it's, you know I think that's something that that is worth considering given where all of those people who eventually made land art lived at the time, which would have been just a few, few blocks from here. So. <clears throat> As planning proceeded on the World Trade Center, conditions were deteriorating at Pruitt Igo. The total population of St. Louis, which was forecast by city planners to grow and grow and grow, in fact plummeted between 1950 and 1970. The white population of the city dropped by two thirds because the Housing Act, which had made Pruitt Igo possible in the first place, also subsidized the highways and mortgages that lured, lured most of the city's white middle class to the suburbs. Um, so that you know, this combination of white flight and black sequestration radically altered the makeup of the city. And the housing authority's model had never anticipated the problem of low occupancy. And without full occupancy, there was no money to maintain the buildings. Um, so infrastructure rapidly deteriorated, windows were left unrepaired, elevators broke, maintenance crew couldn't keep up with the things. And it became very quickly what Joyce Ladner, uh, the civil rights activists referred to as a residence of last resort. Incrementally, occupancy fell, physical conditions deteriorated, and hostility towards the housing authority grew. Meanwhile, in New York, in the second half of the 1960s, the political climate in the US has shifted dramatically. Uh, the you know, growing frustration with the war in Vietnam, distrust of the government projects of any sort, meant that the World Trade Center was becoming more and more of like a monument to bureaucracy, or sort of an embodiment of this military industrial complex. And you can start to see Otto Louise Huxtable's confidence in Yamasaki kind of waver at this point. And, and she writes in 1966, the Trade Center Towers could be the start of the new skyscraper age or the biggest tombstones in the world. Um, and this is a photograph from around that time. A another sort of physical, fascinating physical aspect of Yamasaki's person is that like Ibsen's master builder, Halvard Solness, Yamasaki was afraid of heights. Mm -hmm. So in order to make occupants in the Trade Center feel comfortable, he based the width of all these tall vertical windows in the Trade Center on the width of his own shoulders, which were quite slight, just 22 inches. And so he inscribed his body in this way on the entire facade of the two tallest buildings in the world. This, of course, made the Port Authority very angry because they wanted to kind of have these spectacular views. And this kind of led to another huge fight between Tozzoli and Yamasaki, which Yamasaki finally threatened to quit. Tozzoli went up and met him at the plaza and convinced him to stay and kind of life went on. But it was really taking a physical toll on Yamasaki and his, he had a seizure, he, rushed, he was sent to the hospital. You know, people were shuttling drawings back and forth to the hospital bed. Like he falls in love with one of his nurses and they get briefly married. But then in 1969, there's like this other sort of sudden turn in his romantic life. And he and Terry, after eight years of divorce, decide to get remarried in 1969. 
And so the building began to take shape that summer. Uh, the photograph on the left is from 1969, which is the summer of Woodstock. It's the summer of Stonewall. And the, this tower is rising right at the same time. And I think it became harder and harder for people to reconcile what this building meant with the humanist philosophy that Yamasaki had, had espoused when talking about it. Um, and then Lewis Mumford wrote uh, in his book, The Pentagon of Power, which actually came out before the buildings were even completed. This is just a model on the left. He, in one of the only kind of photographs in the book, he creates this direct juxtaposition between the World Trade Center and homage to New York, both Rockefeller sponsored machines um, that is obviously quite ominous. Um, and so Mumford is tapping into this kind of undertone of violence that was always attached not only to the World Trade Center but to tall buildings in New York. And you can see it looking back. But you can, you can trace it back to even before the World Trade Center was an idea. Uh, you know, in 1945 when uh, Yamasaki still lived in New York, E.B. White wrote, and here, in, here is New York, <coughs> A single flight of planes, no bigger than a wedge of geese, can quickly end this island fantasy, burn the towers, crumble the bridges, and turn the underground passages into lethal chambers. Uh, again, that was from 1945. And this photograph from 1970 was taken by Leslie Robertson, the engineer of the World Trade Center. And it's actually such an incredible photograph because it really shows you exactly what's happening structurally in the building. Um, and this would have been when the structure was complete, but the, the interior floors weren't finished. And there are also photographs, incredible photographs from this time by artists. Uh, uh, Pierre de Fonil on the, on the left here, the, um, uh, Andre Cortez's photograph that later became the cover of Don DeLillo's book, Underworld, Gordon Matter Clark, Tejing Ze. You know, all these people were documenting it. This is a photograph by Baldwin Lee on the left and Thomas Struth on the right. Um, sort of interesting perpendicular perspectives. Uh, then several years later, Agnes Dennis's project Wheatfield on the landfill that filled up Battery Park. Um, but this was, of course, you know, a mo very different moment in the art world than the one in which I was writing the book. And uh, I think I was going to speak briefly about that, although I, I want to keep things moving. But you know. I was writing in this in a time when the art world was really moving away from the sort of local model to a bigger global industry. And that the, these sort of forces were conspiring that even after having reopened the gallery two years later, it became clear that it, it was no longer viable for Jane and her partner to keep the gallery open because the sort of, there was like this strain where the top of the market was pulling all this money up to the top and there was a lot of energy on the bottom, but it became increasingly impossible for mid-sized galleries to stay open. Um, but I'm going to skip over that for now, just in the interest of time, and get back to the World Trade Center. So as the south tower of the World Trade Center began to climb to meet its twin, the conditions at Pruitt Igo were deteriorating very rapidly. It became a case study in failed housing policy. And by the late 1960s, there were more sociologists working at Pruitt Igo than maintenance workers. Books like Lee Rainwater's Behind Ghetto Walls and Oscar Newman's Defensible Space really controlled the narrative of what was happening. And then in January of 1970, uninsulated pipes froze throughout the building, leaving the residents without heat and water and causing widespread damage. And at that point, it was sort of beyond repair. And, and with, the sort of, with the same zeal that previous administrations had pointed to Pruitt Igo as a mascot of reform, the Nixon administration presented the project as a symbol of welfare state socialism and profligate government spending. So in October of 1971, George Romney, Nixon's Secretary of Housing, ordered the complex to be torn down. And so it really became and this is one of the first buildings that was ever destroyed by controlled demolition. And it was set up very much as a spectacle. Uh, so there were cameras, uh, both still and film cameras, on site for this event. Uh, <clears throat> and the first three buildings came down in March of 1972. And footage was broadcast all over the world. Uh, this is a photograph by, that was in, in Life magazine. And this was only a few weeks before the World Trade Center opened in 1973. I'm not, not, not going there yet. And the city, uh, the World Trade Center opened as the city was sliding into bankruptcy. 
And Otto Louise's Huxtable, oh, sorry, Otto Louise Huxtable's final review was really a devastating rebuke of Yamasaki. He, he, she said that he had tried for something special, but the result was nothing but Disneyland, fairy tale, blockbuster, and General Motors Gothic. These like very kind of branded adjectives that carry kind of all the weight of like an elite East Coast critic dismissing him as someone popular and provincial and corporate. And Yamasaki writes this kind of seven page rebuttal to Otto Louise. And it's like this really sad kind of exchange. And, and she ultimately just writes back and, and at the end, you are the architect and I'm the critic and this is an honest parting of the ways. So then you get to this period where the World Trade Center just sort of languishes through the 70s as the city is kind of going bankrupt. And the Prudigo is cleared the World Trade Center is losing $20 million a year. It's a disaster. In 1975, Robert Twomley wrote in the New York Times, <coughs> quote, if the World Trade Center were to suffer the fate of Prude Igo housing projects in St. Louis, death by dynamite, many of us would cheer, but good fortune comes so rarely. And even Huxtable now sees the towers only as sort of this act of aggression, right? Like rising over everything else, like gleaming, like newly minted money. And part of the reason that there, there's this amazing detail where part of the reason the Trade Center gleamed like it did is because when it was built, energy was still so cheap to meter that there were no light switches. Like every floor had just an on off light switch. So often the lights would be on all night long throughout the energy crisis, um, which, you know, 20,000 fluorescent lights on for no reason. And the landfill, because the city couldn't build, um, on these 92 acres of landfill that later became Battery Park, they were just covered with sand. So you get this kind of amazing landscape, sort of Ersatz Beach, uh, which of course is the image on the cover of the book. And I think this is a really important image because this is, this is you know, I think we think of 9-11 as this turning point in New York City, but this is the summer of 1977. It's the summer of Sam, the summer of the Bronx fires. The city's totally broke, you know. Um, like the, there were sort of forty percent of the South Bronx was destroyed by fire uh, by the end of the seventies, you know, and it, the city was really kind of at a low point, uh, and it was at this moment when the city nearly goes bankrupt and gets bailed out by the crisis regime that something fundamental in New York City changes. Right, what was originally kind of Al Smith and LaGuardia's idea of a workers' paradise has now gets replaced by uh, a city, that, you know, a, a real kind of city that's driven by finance. And you shift from the workers' paradise to what Mayor Bloom Bloomberg would eventually describe as a, uh, a city as luxury product. And I think the character of the World Trade Center changes in a fundamental way. It, it was intended as a sort of center of, to, to preside over a real a port city and, and instead becomes a sort of symbol um, like the cover of Bright Lights by Bright City as, as a sort of center of Wall Street commerce. Um, I'm, I'm getting to the end here. So I first went inside 432 Park when it was still under construction. And uh, in, in the passage of the book, I write that when John Paul Sartre visited Manhattan for the first time, he wrote of a great American desert under an icy sky, a city for the far-sighted. Uh, where nothing is in focus except the vanishing point. So outside of 432 Park's north facing windows, the entirety of central Manhattan unfolds before you and the parallel axes of pa Park and Madison recede towards a vanishing point beyond the Harlem River. These perspectival lines converge in New York's 15th congressional district, which covers most of the South Bronx and is the poorest per capita in the country. New York's 12th congressional district, which covers most of the Upper East Side, including this building, is the wealthiest in the country, and these two neighborhoods are separated by less than 10 miles. Um, this slender tower makes it possible to see both ends of the vast financial spectrum that really is New York City. And actually, on a clear day, you can see as far as Trenton, New Jersey, a capital city whose entire eight square miles of which contain less real estate value than this single address. Um, so standing in this window, you really get the sense that this was designed, um, I guess, as I wrote, to be looked up to and 
you know, to be looked down on. Uh, and Harry Macklow, who, who developed it, said that it was almost like Mona Lisa, except instead of looking at you, you're looking, it's, it, uh, <clears throat> sorry, instead of looking at you, you're looking at it wherever you are. You can't escape it. Um, okay, back to Yamasaki quickly. This uh, is sort of the most distinctive building of his career after the World Trade Center. Uh, it's the Rainier Tower in Seattle. It's a 41-foot story balanced on this little pedestal. And uh, when Huxtable reviewed this building, which she did without actually going to see it, she wrote that it was a crime against urban nature, that some buildings are built, but others, such as this, are perpetrated. And there was this sort of unanimous condemnation of this building, um, although I actually think it's quite magnificent. Um, and it, that suggests something about how the con critical consensus was beginning to calcify around Yamasaki's work. Uh, but, the mo but the single paragraph that really defined, I think, his career was by Charles Jenks in the language of postmodern architecture, which was published the same year. And, um, in which he wrote, modern architecture died in St. Louis, Missouri on July 15th, 1972 at 3.32 PM, when the infamous Pruitt-Igo scheme, or rather several of its slab blocks, were given the final coup de grace by dynamite. Previously, it had been vandalized, mutilated, and defaced by its black inhabitants. He actually takes the word black out of future um, editions of the book, but it's in the original. Previously, it had been vandalized, mutilated, and defaced by its black inhabitants, and although millions of dollars were pumped back in trying to keep it alive, fixing the broken elevators, repairing the smashed windows, it was finally put out of its misery. Boom, boom, boom. So this is the sort of iconic, anyone who's a student of architecture knows this passage very well. But what's fascinating about it, despite it being one of the most referenced passages in architectural history, is it's also completely sloppy, right? He gets, he, the buildings were destroyed. The photograph was taken in April, not July. The buildings are 11 stories, not 14. They never won an award. He makes all these mistakes, but the point is it doesn't matter because the photograph really holds the moment. And the photograph gives people what they wanted, which was a moment to kind of pinpoint the end of modernism. Um, I'm landing the plane here. I can see the, the sharks gathering. Don't worry. Uh, I'm almost done. Um, the image of Pruitt Igo crashing to the ground allowed people the satisfaction of pinpointing the exact moment, inexact as it may have been, when the promise of American modernism collapsed into a heap of rubble. Uh, you know, and, the, and the, there's no doubt that the buildings failed, but I think that no architectural solution could have, have overcome the larger social and political conditions in, in this specific case. And the, um, the truth is that sort of, okay, so that, that, you know, the occupants of this building had been dis displaced 20 years earlier, and they were displaced again when the buildings were destroyed. And when the last, res there's sort of an interesting final detail, which is that when the last residents of Prudigo, the ones who had the least resources left, the, South Le the St. Louis Housing Authority actually gave many of them vouchers to resettle in one particular suburb north of St. Louis. Ferguson. So in August of 2004, when police in Ferguson shot and killed Michael Brown, the St. Louis journalist and former Pruitt Igo resident, Syl Sylvester Brown, drew a direct line between the failure of Pruitt Igo and Ferguson, be it by design, accident, or benign neglect. The fuse that led to the explosion in Ferguson was lit in St. Louis more than 60 years ago. <clears throat> Yamasaki died in February, on February 6, 1986, from complications related to stomach cancer. He was 73. When the Detroit Free Press asked Paul Goldberger, Paul, I don't know if you're here, but um, you know, my apologies for what I'm about to say. Uh, he told them that Yamasaki did a number of very prominent buildings, even if they didn't change the course of architecture. Now, I know where he was coming from, but I think time may have proven Goldberger wrong, because neither Pruitt Igo nor the World Trade Center will be remembered as masterpieces, nor perhaps should they be, but it's hard to imagine another building or another pair of buildings, which in their lifespan, from conception to construction to spectacular violent destruction, have exerted greater influence on the course of American architecture. It's difficult to imagine any story that has shaped the culture and politics of architecture in the last 80 years more than those told by the handful of photographs of Pruitt Igo tumbling to the ground or the thousands of images of the World Trade Center collapsing under its own weight. Um, and in closing, I think it's interesting, you know, with 20 years of distance now, tomorrow, from 9-11, to think how much 
9-11 defined about the first 20 years of my adult life. And I often say to students now how interesting it is to think that COVID and perhaps also climate change are gonna define the next 20 years of their life in the same way. And I think that's the point where these sort of ideas of illness and, and um, architecture become very relevant today to think about how the current conditions might inform the future of architecture and what it means for a building to be a sick building now. Um, you know, I think there are examples like the Grenfell Tower fire uh, in London in 2017, or even the collapse of the condos in Surfside, that suggests an approach to architecture where choices are being made for economic reasons that are really failing the occupants of the building in a very dramatic and dangerous way. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how architecture deals with that in the coming years. But uh, I guess if I could end with a parting thought here, it would be the hope uh, that knowing more about Yamasaki might, able, might help you um, see tomorrow when we're bombarded by these images of two buildings that have really come to symbolize a certain kind of unilateralism or xenophobia instead kind of to think of them as the product of the imagination of a man who had overcome so much and to design them in a way that he believed, however quixotically, to really be symbols of something quite the opposite of what they have uh, come to represent. I'm done. I, I apologize for going two minutes over. I know you want to do remarks. So. Um, I say, that you're going to sign the books. Oh yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, all right. I, just before everyone runs out, there are books in the bookstore. I'd be happy to sign them. I also believe our captain here is going to give some remarks about the outside. No, that's not happening. Okay. Apologies. No, we're going. There's just will be signing books in the shop. So if anybody wants to get a copy or ask some questions, um, we'll be happy to walk over there. Right. Okay. Sorry. Okay, great. Sorry, great. Yeah.